So let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we bless and thank you for everything that we have. For our life and for the gift of faith, for the gift of your Spirit who lives within us. For the desire that you have for each of us by name. For the call of your son to enter into an ever more profound friendship with him. Father, we do again offer you these next number of weeks. We pray that your spirit would be powerfully at work within us, individually and as a parish family. Continue to help us to grow to look more like Jesus, to think more like him, to love more like him. Father, we pray for the gift of your spirit upon us tonight, for ears to be attentive to your voice, however it is that you might wish to speak to us, to show us concretely and practically the things that we can do right now to cooperate with you so as to be the men and women that you made us to be and that we want to be. Help us as a parish to make a difference in the community in which we live. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I mentioned uh, that one of the things we want to do at the, um, kind of like the, the last third, so we'll think of the nights in thirds. Huh? So the first third is eating, that'll be fun. Second third is me talking, not as much fun. The third part is us, small group discussion, and then large group discussion at the end. And... Um, at the, uh, at the start of each of the talks, what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of throw out to you to have in mind to come up with two questions at the table so that when we get back together as a large group, we can talk about those and, and kind of dive deeper into whatever it is that we're going to do. Um, tonight's kind of a, an, an overview of what we're going to try to do in the weeks ahead and then something really practical to think about for the week ahead. But I want to throw this out as a question for you just to ponder... Uh, individually and then at your tables, and then um, I'm going to ask you to give us, uh, myself, Father Clements here, Father Steve's down in retreat, so keep him in prayer, he's in um, chilly Jacksonville, it's down to 50, <laughs> so pray for frost in Jacksonville, I am, um, but it, it would be really helpful for us as a pastoral team, the, not just the, the priests and, and Deacon Vince as well, but us as a whole pastoral team to to hear back from you um, something with regards to this question. What can we, as a parish, give to you to better help you achieve the goal that we're going to talk about tonight? So what can we offer you? What do you expect of us? What do you need from us? And hopefully as we, uh, we go through the next little bit, that'll become a little bit clearer what I'm asking. But that's what I want you to just ponder as we're, we're talking. So I've had an awful lot of conversations with folks over the last um, couple of weeks since the construction's been going on in the upstairs of the church, the area behind the sanctuary where the, there's now a wall and then the music room is behind that. And we've kind of made it possible for the 24-hour chapel to move over here to be in the, uh, in the day chapel. But the question that keeps coming up to me, is there anything going to be put on that wall that, between the two lights that's directly across from the chapel that you walk out of? So as you're walking down the long hallway, um, and, and there's now what used to be an open area where all the couches were, now there's a wall. And so the question is, are we going to, are we going to do anything with that? And the answer is yes. And this is what we're going to put on the wall. If you turn your attention to the screen, just see them. These are going to go on that wall. Um, more than this, but this is the start, if you will. The, the idea for us is as we walk out of the chapel, or as we walk down the hallway, to be confronted with, with these people. So on the far left is Elizabeth Ann Seton. Next to her is um, Fulton Sheen. Next to him is um, Katari Takakwitha, and next to her is Solanus Casey. In addition to them, we'll have um, Pierre Toussaint, not Fritz Toussaint, by the way, for those of you who follow Michigan football. Um, he's a running back who 
He's a great guy, I'm sure, but doesn't deserve to be on the wall. <laughs> and then um, uh, Mother Cabrini. And then in the middle of them will be um, the image of Mary that was on our Christmas card this year that we sent out to everybody in the parish. So again, the idea is for us to, to walk out of the chapel or walk down the hall and to see them. Why them? Um, I want people to see them. I want, I want to see them. Because if there's one thing that they all have in common, what is it? Yeah, they're American. They're American saints. They're modern. They remind us that sainthood and saintliness is not something for people centuries ago in Europe or the Middle East or in Africa. It's for us. Now. And hopefully they'll... The diversity of who they are. Akatari is a young woman. Solanus is a priest who never even gets um, faculties to celebrate Mass. Huh? He's just a porter. We don't even have that office anymore in the church, but he, his task was simply to open up the door for people. That worked out rather well for him and for the people who met him. Um, and, and we're working with some uh, artists down in Florida who are doing these. And the question that keeps coming back to us uh, as they paint these, we've given them some images, but they keep working on them and tweaking them. And they keep asking us, what would you like in their hands? And how would you like us to depict them? That's the, the kind of common question that they're asking. And I would suggest that's a great way for us to begin this Alpha 201. So, as, as I've, I think I mentioned this at Mass uh, maybe a, a couple of weeks ago or so, but the way I've thought about these eight weeks that begin tonight is something like, okay, we just went through Alpha. What's the Omega? Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, 24 letters in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter. Huh? Jesus says, I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. So Alpha was just the beginning. What's the end? What's the goal? What's the point, if you will? <coughs> the answer to that question is found in those paintings. The goal of all of this is to become a saint. The omega is to become a saint. One of the most common questions that, uh, that we get as priests, Father Clement can testify to this, is, you know, Father, I'm just trying to figure out what God's will is for my life. How many people have ever asked that question? <laughs> I can tell you the answer. I, I, I tried to rehearse my best Nikki impersonation. Of, <laughs> Will you please open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, but it just doesn't work. So... Um, <laughs> But open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, and this is what it says. For this is the will of God. Your sanctification. Your holiness. For you to be a saint. For me to be a saint. That's the will. That's the plan. That's the omega. So... What I want to try to do tonight is just do three things. Um, one is just to lay out in front of you um, something like the lens through which uh, Father Clement, Father Steve, myself, um, folks on our pastoral team are, are trying to look at everything right now that we do as a parish. This, this is a really exciting thing, quite frankly, because in, in Pope Francis and all that he's doing, and especially in the letter that he just wrote, The Joy of the Gospel, which is very worth reading, is more or less um, encouraging us, challenging us to come up with a new paradigm of being a parish. It's very exciting, quite frankly. Um, it lends itself to lots of creativity and lots of prayer. Thus, our desire to hear from you how we can better help you achieve the goal for which we were made, namely to become a saint. So I want to just kind of lay out for you that lens and, and kind of get you used to the vocabulary that we're using so that it will be the vocabulary that all of us as a parish begin to really use as we think about what's going on in our lives as a parish family. Uh, second, I want to just give you a, a kind of a quick preview of what we're going to do in the weeks to come so that you have an idea of what's coming and why. And then lastly is, uh, is to suggest something very 
I hope, very practical, very concrete to help us to reach the goal of becoming a saint. So that's what we're going to try to do tonight. First, the new lens. Uh, a priest friend of mine who's uh, a member of the Companions of the Cross, which is the order that Father Pierre and Father Simon, who often help us out, uh, belongs to. When he's talking about parish life, and when he's specifically talking about the work of evangelization, uh, he uses an expression which, which really has become the mantra for us in our office as to how to think about what a parish should be doing. And, and this is what he says. We need to be doing three things. We need to be making disciples. We need to be molding disciples. And we need to be missioning disciples. That's the, that's the triad that he uses. That, that really has, you know, we've made a point of saying, you know, Alpha wasn't just a program that we were going to do, and now, hey, it wasn't that great. We had a thousand people go through it. Now let's go back to normal. Um, there is no going back to normal for us. It, it has totally changed the paradigm of what we're trying to do and, and, and really lent itself to us um, relying on the Holy Spirit to show us what is it that you want us to do in this community at this time right now so as to better accomplish the goal that you have for us as a parish and as individuals. So Alpha 101, if you will, is all about making disciples. Now, don't misunderstand me by that. I know that there's a, a number of us in this room who for years or decades have been walking in a, a deep friendship with the Lord. Uh, we've been living the life of discipleship. But it's amazing the responses that we got from people on the guest evaluation forms that you all filled out as Alpha was concluding. It's amazing the percentage of people who would say that Alpha has made in either significant or life-changing impact on them. So 52% of us who went through Alpha said that as a result of that, um, we now have a deeper faith or we've grown in faith. 52% out of roughly 1,000 people. Have either grown in faith or their faith has become deeper. 10%, 100 folks in our parish, would say that as a result of Alpha, they have had a significant life-changing experience with Jesus. That's phenomenal. That means we have somewhere along the lines of five to 600 people in our parish who, as a result of what happened over the last number of months, have either grown in faith or their life is totally different because they met the Lord. In fact, um, that is precisely the goal of Alpha, right? Is to lead people into a, a deeper relationship with Jesus. In, in the letter, which is called The Joy of the Gospel in English, Pope Francis um, puts it this way. This is in paragraph, uh, if you wanna note this to yourself, uh, 164 and, and 165. He says, the first proclamation must ring out over and over. Jesus Christ loves you. He gave his life to save you. And now he is living at your side every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. This first proclamation is called first, not because it exists at the beginning and can then be forgotten or replaced by other more important things. It's first in a qualitative sense because it is the principal proclamation, the one which we must hear again and again in different ways. It's the message capable of responding to the desire of the infinite, which abides in every human heart. The centrality of the kerygma, which we keep saying that's what Alpha is all about, the proclamation of the kerygma. The kerygma is the proclamation of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Calls for stressing those elements which are most needed today. It has to express God's saving love, which precedes any moral and religious obligation on our part. That's what's causing all the fear with Francis. 
people mistakenly think Francis is going, hey, he's just like tossed out all the moral teachings. No, he hasn't. This is what he's saying. He says, the proclamation of the love of God has to precede everything else. Then everything else follows, but this has to be first. It should not impose the truth, but appeal to freedom. It should be marked by joy, encouragement, liveliness, and a harmonious balance, which will not reduce preaching to a few doctrines which are at times more philosophical than evangelical. All this demands on the part of the evangelizer certain attitudes which foster openness to the message, approachability, readiness for dialogue, patience, a warmth and welcome which is non-judgmental. Wasn't that alpha? That, that was the beauty, right? We, we sat at a table and we could say anything. <laughs> I mean, anything. There was no judgment. The message over and over again was just leading us into an encounter with the God who is love. Why did he die for me? And then it's only after coming to know that, then do we begin to ask ourselves, so now what am I supposed to do with that? And, and that raises the question, so, so what now? Huh? What do we do after Alpha? So again, Pope Francis in this letter, he puts it this way. This is in paragraph 160. He says, the first proclamation also calls for ongoing formation and maturation. Evangelization aims at a process of growth which entails taking seriously each person and God's plan for his or her life. All of us need to grow in Christ. It's a great expression. We need to grow in Christ. Evangelization should stimulate a desire for this growth so that each of us can say wholeheartedly, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He goes on to say uh, a little bit later that one of the ways that we do that is to, for a parish or a community to consider offer what he calls an ongoing formation involving the entire community in a renewed appreciation of the liturgical science of Christian initiation. One of the ways we're going to do that, we're going to start this weekend, uh, much like we preached on the theme at Alpha at all the Masses uh, on Sundays. So starting this weekend at every... Uh, mass, we're just going to spend the next seven weeks preaching on the sacraments, most especially helping us to understand, so we're all talking about the encounter with God and the encounter that happens with Jesus in all these different ways. Meanwhile, here we are as Catholics going, and then we do all these rituals and whatnot. I mean, what happens in the sacraments? I mean, does anything happen in the sacraments? And what we want to do is help people understand objectively the most amazing way we encounter God is in the sacraments. Most of us don't know that. I mean, really? Like, I know something's happening when I come to Mass, but what's happening? Something's happening when I go to confession, but what's happening? So we had decided to do this a couple of weeks ago, and then just today I find out that Pope Francis has started a new series of catechesis on Wednesdays on the sacraments. <laughs> I thought, okay. I think I'm hearing you, Lord, so uh, I'm very encouraged by that. So, um, the goal of Alpha 201 is to help us to grow in Christ. To let the Lord mold us. One of the ways Bishop Burns, uh, he's one of the auxiliary bishops in the, in the Archdiocese, just a fantastic guy. He put it this way at a gathering with some folks from the Archdiocese. He said, we need serious application of the scripture to our lives right now so that we can begin to live the life of heaven now not just get to heaven. That's a great distinction. Serious application of scripture to our lives so that we can begin now to live the life of heaven so that we can become saints. So that we can reach the goal. So that's exactly what we're going to do over the next seven weeks. We're going to, we're going to look seriously at scripture on seven different topics which show up for all of us in one way or another throughout our lives. We want to learn what the Lord says to us about the topics so that we can grow in Christ 
and let him mold and form us. So we're going to look at, um, next week we're going to start with forgiveness, because forgiveness is the hinge. If I don't forgive, if I don't learn to show mercy, then I, I almost immediately block the Lord from acting in my life. So we talk about that first. Then we move on to fear. We talk about suffering. Talk about greed. Talk about lust. Uh, talk about the importance of community. And we got one wild card in there too. We have to decide what we're going to do with that. So we'll leave that to the Holy Spirit. So that's what we're going to do in the uh, the times to come tonight. Back to those paintings. Can we throw those up real quick? Maybe we can. No, never mind. Have your drink your wine. <laughs> I'll have mine later. So, think of the paintings, because that's not a saying on the screen right now. So, imagine the paintings are on the screen. So, imagine you're looking at the painting. Uh, and the question to consider is this. Do you have, right now, a plan? And are you working at it? So that one day, we'll make a painting of you. Are you right now, am I right now, concretely working at a plan so that paintings will be made of us? Don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I don't mean that in some sort of arrogant, pompous way. That's, there's no room for that in the body of Christ. It's not like, hey, look at me. That's, that's not what this is about. It's about surrendering to the Lord in such a way so that one day people are calling whoever it is at a given church saying, we want to put an image of Sarah on our wall. How should we depict her? And it's you. Oh, we want a married couple. We want Jim and Joan on the wall. What should we put in their hands? Because if we're not doing that, then we're really misunderstanding what the whole point of life is. Just uh, yesterday, I had to meet with a, a gentleman, a young man, who just got diagnosed with cancer. Common event in my office. Made the point of saying to me, you know, Father, uh, I live by goals. He's very successful in his work. He says, I'm very successful at my work because I always have in front of me goals. Goals drive me. He realizes right now I need new goals. I need a goal to get through chemo. I need a goal to get through all the treatment that I'm gonna go through. I need some low-hanging fruit that me and my wife can have hanging in front of us going, okay, when we're done with this, we're going to do that. We're going to go on a vacation. We're going to go on a trip. We're going to celebrate an anniversary. Whatever it is, I need goals. And he's right. And there's nothing quite like cancer to wake somebody up to the fact that as important as all those are, the real goal, the only ultimate goal that I've got to be focused on is the omega which is sainthood. One of the French writers of the 19th century used to put it this way. It's a quote that we repeat often around here, I know, but the only tragedy in life is not to become a saint. Just elected, what, three, four guys to the Baseball Hall of Fame today just got announced. God has a Hall of Fame. It's the saints. It's within your reach and mine. The grace is a given. All it takes is our work, our cooperation with it. So Sheen, Casey, Kateri, uh, Elizabeth Ann Seton, all these people in their own day, they saw a need and they responded to it. If, if Elizabeth Ann Seton doesn't respond to the need that she sees, maybe we don't have Catholic schools in our country. Seriously. If Solanus Casey doesn't respond to the call of God in his life, tens of thousands of people in our own local community, their lives would not have been changed in the way that they have been changed. They never would have encountered the incredibly healing power of God and of his love. Anybody here ever meet Solanus? Few of us did. Extraordinary man. But a great example of someone who just in our day and age took the time to say, Lord, I'll surrender. Have at it. And some of us now, we can raise our hands and say, I met that man, and he said this to me. 
about me or about someone that I asked him to pray for. And it's changed our lives forever. Centuries ago, there was a, a Spaniard named Inigo. Inigo was a, one of 13 kids from a rather rough family. They were Catholic, but they weren't exactly practicing. This guy had um, no desires whatsoever for God and certainly no desire for holiness. But he had his knee blown apart in a battle. And so he was convalescing. Uh, before this time, he was uh, someone who was obsessed, if you will, with attaining personal glory. Um, he was a womanizer, uh, an expert dancer, very fancy dresser. When he's convalescing after his uh, leg was broken, because they wore, you know, kind of tight-fitting clothes at the time, so he, he noticed that the bone in his knee was still sticking out. So he told the doctor, he says, I need you to re-break that so that the bone doesn't stick out because women are never going to be attracted to me. So they rebroke it. <laughs> While he's convalescing, he asked for some books to be brought to him to pass the time. So he asked for books on, you know, knights and romantic chivalry and that kind of thing. And instead, somebody brought him a life of Christ and somebody brought him a book on the legends of the saints. And since he couldn't go anywhere and he had nothing else to read, he read them. And God broke in and changed everything and showed him what real glory looked like, what real nobility looked like, what real manhood looked like, what real courage looked like. He ended up changing his name to one of the heroes of the early church, a man named Ignatius of Antioch, founded the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. In the last 500 plus years, literally, Hundreds of millions of people have come to encounter Jesus because of him. But he's gone now. He's not living anymore. Solanus isn't living anymore. Sheen's not living anymore. Kateri's not living anymore. Elizabeth Ann Seton's not living anymore. They've handed the baton to you and to me. And now it's our turn. It's our turn to fight the fight. It's our turn to run the race. It's our turn to keep the faith. How do we do that? This is the really practical part. One of the things that, that, that we're wrestling with, quite frankly, pastorally, is so what do we do with, with us who just went through Alpha, who are energized, who want more, and I wish I could say something other than what I'm about to say, um, but there are no shortcuts for the next step. And what I mean by that is, now it's on me and it's on you personally to take serious responsibility for what I'm going to do and what you're going to do to respond. I have to and you have to, we have to all individually come up with a plan, if you will, so as to accomplish the goal. So let me give you an image. When, um, when couples come in for marriage prep, one of the things that, uh, that I'll have them do maybe the second or so time that we get together is I'll say to them something like this. Um, this is just common sense, right? Businesses tend to fail because they don't have a plan. The lions lose because they don't have a plan. Uh, marriages don't thrive because they don't have a plan oftentimes. They just kind of think, well, I love you, you love me, how hard can this be, right? You know, we'll just live happily ever after. So if you were to ask my mom and dad, married 63 years in August, how did you do this? They wouldn't go. Wow, we just really lucked out. <laughs> like, that's not an answer, right? You know that. 50 years, right? So, it's the same with sainthood. So I, I encourage a couple, I say, do this. Why don't, you, why don't you make, for lack of a better term, make a pie chart. And think of, what are all the different dimensions in our life together as a married couple that go into our life together? So, Everything. Finances, retirement, two different things. Um, prayer, intimacy, sex, um, 
in-laws, children, dating, fighting, communicating, everything. So what are all the different areas of your life? And then say, okay, for each of those areas, what would we say greatness looks like? And then ask yourself, do we have that? And if we don't have that, what do we need to do to get it? And then it becomes something like a budget. You're not a slave to it, but it's a business plan for a married couple to thrive. And you keep going back to it. You pull it out every seven months. And you look at it. How are we doing with that? So it is with sainthood. We need a business plan for sainthood. Now, that may sound strange. It might sound like, how do you plan sainthood? Well, John Paul says you can. So in the letter that he wrote after um, the beginning of the new millennium, which in Latin is called Novo Millennio Innuente, which I loosely translate into, what do we do now? <laughs> and that's a very loose translation, by the way. He says this. He says, can holiness ever be planned? What might the word holiness mean in the context of a pastoral plan? To ask people who are coming into the church, do you wish to receive baptism? Or those of you who are parents, what do you ask of God's church? and you say baptism, what you're really saying is, do you wish to become holy? Do you wish your children to become holy? Do you wish your children to become saints? Remember that, Jamie? Do you wish to enter into the church? I do. What's that mean? I wish to become holy. It means to set before them the radical nature of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. This ideal of perfection must not be misunderstood as if it involves some kind of extraordinary existence possible only for a few uncommon heroes of holiness. The ways of holiness are many, according to the vocation of each individual. The time has come, he says, to repropose wholeheartedly to everyone this high standard of ordinary Christian living. The whole life of the Christian community and of Christian families must lead in this direction. I have to plan to become a saint. So what's that look like? Well, this isn't an exhaustive list. This is just a, a way to get us started. I don't think you can cheat on this, meaning I don't think you can do this without writing. This is the hard part. Like, you and I have to write a plan. What's my plan to become a saint? And here's a series of things to think about. It's not exhaustive by any means, but it gets the conversation going. Prayer. What do I consider greatness to look like in prayer? What do I, what do I think I need to do every day in terms of prayer to become a saint? Don't ask the question, do I pray enough? The answer to that is no. Nobody prays enough. It's impossible. Uh, the, but am I praying as much as I should be praying? Scripture. There's no way I'm going to let God form me if I don't read his word. I have to let him form me. And he forms me in the scripture. Service. Do I reach out of myself? <coughs> Do I look to volunteer? Whether it's in the parish community, in the local community, with the poor, whoever it might be. Sacramental life. Do I have a goal, like, my goal was to get to confession every two months. I'll tell you this right now, if that's not in your list, if you don't get to confession every two months, I'd start there. Maybe I'd start here. If you haven't been to confession in years, come back. Just come back. But I got to get to confession often. I go every two weeks now. I, I could go every day, but I, I Father Clement, we hear enough confessions. He doesn't have to hear mine that often. So. But, you know, confession, um, not always Sunday Mass, obviously, but maybe, do, do I think it's possible to really achieve greatness on something like a starvation diet? Where I'm not, where I'm only feeding on the Eucharist once a week. Once we really come to understand 
objectively speaking, this is the greatest source of strength that I can ever encounter in my life. Why wouldn't I come more often? Some of us can't. I know because of work. I mean, we shoot to get there once a, once during the week in addition to Sunday or twice. Many people who start doing this, they start coming every day and then they just can't stop. You'll gradually come to realize, like, I just can't thrive without the Eucharist every day. I can't, I can't live. I'm not strong enough. I used to think I was, but now I've come to realize otherwise. Sin. What's the, what's the one or the two really significant obstacles in my life right now which are keeping me from reaching the goal? How am I going to overcome those? Am I just going to go, well, shoot, that's just the way I am. Nuts. <laughs> or am I going to try to get over it? Let the Lord change me. Fasting. Do I ever fast? Jesus doesn't say if you fast. He says when you fast. Do I have a plan in my life for fasting? Some of us can't fast from food because of health reasons, but we can fast from something else. Maybe I fast from the news, media, whatever. Alms. Not arms. Alms. Do I give alms? Do I look at the resources that I have as a means by which I can share with the poor? If, 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 you, don't, if you don't get convicted when you read Pope Francis, you're not reading Pope Francis. Because he's constantly throwing the poor in front of us, reminding us of our obligation to do what we can to help. To lift them up, not to just care for them so that you know, they just simply receive our mercy, but to lift them up and to set them on their feet and to get them on their way. That's what he's encouraging us to do. There, there's lots of other things in the list that we could add, by all means. At the table, let's try to do this, because some of these questions, obviously, these are not for small group discussion. These are for us to reflect on in the, in the week ahead. So my, my encouragement for us in the week ahead is just, first of all, to ask, you know, do I have a business plan to become a saint? And if I don't, what is it going to look like? And start working on it. Let's do the work. I think you'll be amazed how helpful it is. Because it'll make it concrete. But at the table, I think we can do this. Huh? Um, it might be worth just just saying amongst each other, do you have a plan? Without getting into details, do you have one? Are you working on one? Have you ever thought this way? Does this make sense? And then, like I threw out to us at the very beginning, what I'd really like to hear back from you, and Father Clement and Father Steve as well, in a particular way tonight, is, okay, so we, we, we dump all this on us tonight. Okay, we've got to get serious about this. How do we help? Pope Francis says something really interesting in his document. It's really shocking to me, quite frankly. It's in uh, the end of paragraph 63. Where he just writes this. In many places, he's talking about parish life, an administrative approach prevails over a pastoral approach, as does, here's the key line, a concentration on administering the sacraments apart from other forms of evangelization. That's an incredible thing to say as a priest. In other words, he's saying, have we become, have we, have we looked at parish life as something like just a dispenser of sacraments? Don't get me wrong, the sacraments are the most amazing encounters. They give grace. We're going to talk about that for a long time in the weeks ahead now, on Sundays. But have we somehow mistakenly thought that's all we need to do is just offer more mass times, offer more sacraments, offer more opportunities for confession, and we forget all the other ways that we can help. And we're just throwing a wide net out to you saying, help us know how to help you. That's the appeal tonight. So that one day, there's St. Mary on the wall. But it's not the mother of God. It's you. Or there's St. Ryan on the wall. And it's you. And you're someone that other young adults in their generation are looking to going, I want to be like him. Okay? All right, so why don't we take, let me take like 20 minutes at a table, okay? It's, it's just about 8. Let's take to about 8.20 right now just to kind of go at this. Try to think about, one, do you have a plan? We're just, I, I'd be curious to, to get a sense from each table, like how many people have a plan to do this or have ever thought this way? And then take some time just amongst yourselves to go, what is it that we can do? What is it that we need to do as a parish to really help you to achieve the goal, Okay.